Okay. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, Joshua Hatton here with Impex Beverages. And we are continuing the uh, Impex Distillery Deep Dive Series, or the, the 3D series, uh, as it were. And today, uh, we are going to have uh, the esteemed uh, Oliver Chilton with us, who, who wears many hats. Though tonight, he's not wearing a hat. He's, he's, he's got nothing on his head. But um, the... Uh, the hat that he is wearing is uh, is that of the blender for Port S. Gag, uh, Isla Single Malt Scotch Whiskey. So I'm going to bring him on, and um, I will warn you, he, he seems a bit tired, but, but I think once we get a little bit of whiskey in him, he'll perk right up. Let's see. Let's see if we can bring his shining face on here. Hello. There he is. Hello. I've got tea. Tea. Tea's keeping me going. Oh, is, is, yeah. is it the tea? Did you did you take a nap beforehand, or are you pulling an all nighter here? No, no naps. Um, I thought about having a nap, and then I just realized I'd sleep all the way through, and then that this would be a very boring conversation for yourself. Well, maybe not. I mean, I like listening to you, so I'm sure other people do. <laughs> I can only take so much of myself, though. It, it's good to have that 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 other person. <sighs> But it is lovely to see your face, and it's lovely to see all of the uh, the bottles of Port Escape that you've got uh, off to your left there. Yeah, so I'm, I may have stolen these all from the office. Um, I have, like, uh, to be fair, some are actually just sitting in the house because I drink them. Um, that's things like the 18-year-old, which she said, you were going to drink tonight. I thought I should probably get one of those. Smart. Um, so, as you know, I steal whiskey from all of our customers before I send it out. Um, <laughs> just a, a case for yourself here and there? Just in case. <laughs> just a case in case of emergencies. Well, um, I really appreciate you staying up until it's 1.30 now your time. Before, when the, the clocks were changing, it was just a four hour difference, but now we're dealing with the five hours. So, yeah, I found out the other day that we only actually do that because Germany did it. So, very much keeping up with the Joneses kind of thing. All right. Yeah, crazy. There you go. There is no scientifically good reason for doing it. Well, there you go. There you go. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah, let, let's, uh, instead of time zones, Let's discuss. Uh, let's discuss the matter at hand, and that's and, and that's Port Askeg. So I, I gave I gave you a, a short introduction, but I wonder if you could let people know because you do wear many hats. Um, let people know your title, and if you could maybe give us a little bit of a history of of Port Askeg and sort of the idea behind Port Askeg and. And quit, just so everyone's aware, um, I'm about to pour a little Port Eskeg 110 proof uh, in preparation of this conversation. See, my, my 110 proof isn't in a fancy bowl. It's uh, a vat yeah. um, Okay, so my title, um, well, I'm at home at the moment, so my title is... Uh, unrepeatable online um at the moment it's really bad because we're up very late my wife can hear me um my job <laughs> title is head blender um business manager which is the the boring bit which i actually really enjoy so that's the actual running of the day-to-day -day stuff um and then the head blender it's the kind of all-encompassing i choose casts i put things together um it makes it sound like there's more than one of me as well. I quite like that. I, I, I did like that bit when it got added in, like I'd have other blenders uh, in a company <laughs> that only has nine people. Um, <laughs> um, so my yeah, my job for Alex Distillers is to look after, well, the main job is looking after all the cask stocks, so all the buying of all, this, all of the new make and age stock that we hold. 
the management of that. Um, that sounds really boring, but it's probably the fun bit. So <laughs> drinking it, uh, working out when it'd be better to drink it, you know, time of day, evening, whenever. Um, and then planning out what we're going to do for the next 5, 10, 15 years. Um, and then on top of that, I do a little bit of uh, running other bits of the business, so sales, and I speak to the marketing team. I'm not sure I run them, much run away from them. Um, and then obviously I work with the ops guys quite a lot because they, they do all the actual work of putting stuff into bottles and making stuff happen. Um, sure. I guess the whole company thing, so Elixir Distillers, um, it's a Sikinda Singh brand. So Sikinda, who owns the Whiskey Exchange, um, started bottling whiskey back in 2002, and it was a hobby side project. It remains a hobby. Uh, just a much bigger one and I started working for him uh, just coming up to 10 years ago I uh, started working in his shop and then in 2013 I, I took on kind of cask buying cask selection um, mm -hmm. back then it was all single casks so it's all really easy you know you, you you taste a cask you say that's nice and then you put it in a bottle it's, it's like the best job um, <laughs> uh, nowadays it's a bit bigger than that so we do Obviously, a few we have a few different labels. So, single malts of Scotland is our kind of oldest label, our, our most established label. Back in two thousand and two, uh, we've got a label for Isla whiskey called Elements of Isla, which is not available in the US at the moment. Um, and then Port Askeg, which is a Isla single malt whiskey, where we don't name the distillery on the label at all, um, and it's it's all based around the kind of character of the whiskies. Mm -hmm. uh, that being said, obviously we'll tell you what's in it because I'm really bad at keeping <laughs> secrets. Uh, so it's it's you know, Port Ask Eggs. It seems to be a, a slightly different approach to independent bottling when you when you think of other brands like 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 your own right single malts of Scotland uh, or Cadden Heads or, or or Duncan Taylor or some of these where where it seems predominantly what's being bottled for those brands are the single casks, but with Port Askeg it's independently bottled whiskey, but, but it's more for a, a brand and, and much larger releases. Do you, do you consider bottling for Port Askeg to be different than bottling for single malts of Scotland? Do you see a delineation between those two types of independent bottlings? Um, yeah, well, certainly it's, it's a different process and obviously, as you say, scale is very different. Um, and there's a different purpose as well. So, you know, independent bottling and like the, the core of it, so those single cask releases and, um, that side that kind of grew out of what Gordon McPhail and, uh, and Cadden Heads and Fairy Brothers and Rudd did historically, like over a hundred years ago, um, but particularly in the 60s and the 70s, that that kind of style of bottling where you're putting someone's distillery on the label um, and you're selecting like a, a single cask or a couple of casks and saying this is a great example of this distiller. Um, mm. I, I see that as a, as a way of expanding the whiskey category for people. So and I strongly believe whiskey is the most diverse spirit. I think Scotch whiskey is by far and away the most diverse of, of the whiskey category. I think it's... It's the most interesting from a flavor point of view. Yes, I'm massively biased, but it's. I, I would argue that if I, if you give me 15 minutes in a locked room with someone and whatever bottles I want, they'll leave loving whiskey. Um, not because of me, but because, frankly, from a range of flavor, I will always find something that you love. And what independent bottling traditionally does is show you those distilleries that you wouldn't normally find, or it shows you the styles and the flavors you wouldn't normally find. Port Askeg has a different, um, there's a similarity, but a slightly different approach. So it's it's more looking at a style of, in this case, Isla whiskey, um, and a particular kind of idea of Isla whiskey. Um, Isla is very much viewed, or a lot of the whiskey distill distillates from Isla are viewed as these kind of big medicinal whiskies. Um, mm. Sometimes I think that can be to their detriment. Sometimes, obviously, it's, it's a massive selling point, as Lefroig has done a very good job of 
um, over here we call that the Marmite advertising. You love it or hate it, you know, and it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a great way of selling your whiskey. However, um, in some ways, I think it underestimates the or simplifies the, the what makes Isla really special, which is the kind of complexity, the fact that you balance fruit and smoke. Um, so the kind of message for Port Escape is that we're, we are trying to show kind of elegant Isla um, where you can taste like kind of citrus fruit um, and blend that with or, or bring in the smoke so that you can introduce more people to that category. Mm. Uh, so it's in some ways it's it is still about expanding people's um, opportunities to try different flavors, but it's more about shining a light on one specific area, one specific place, and one specific style from that place. Sure. So with the with the one ten, which is which is what I have in my glass now, would you say fr from the standpoint of Port Askeg House style, which which I think can be a bit of a confusing statement, given that you know you are sourcing from from a few different distilleries. But would you say that that the approach to Port Askeg um, is is the same whether it's whiskey from this distillery, which you know feel free to mention it if you want. Yeah, uh, as it would be to other distilleries you may source from for different age stated port escades. I wouldn't say that it's about the the approach to the to the distillery. So port escade one ten is is Kalila, right? We we actually have no reason not to tell that we could write on the bowl um, as long as we did it in a within the rules. Um, we choose not to do that because we do use different distillates and some we're not allowed to use the name, so it's easier just to mm. not use any names. Um, the way I look at it is that if you if you view the different distilleries from around Isla, some have very definitive characters um, sp in specific times. In fact, they all have very sp dis uh, definitive characters in specific times. We tend to use Kalila because... It's a very consistent spirit. Um, mm -hmm. It's always kind of, for me, and it's my personal view on it, it's always quite citrus-led. It's it's smoky. It's, it largely falls into the category for me as of an elegant whiskey, quite pretty. Um, mm -hmm. And I think I think that's a good gateway drug. Now, you can look at a distillery like Laphroaig and say, okay, it's very medicinal. How would you ever use that when you want to introduce elegant Isla? But if you go back to Laphroaig from the 90s, Distillate from the 90s, particularly the early 90s, fruit to bat. Well, fruit to bat, probably 1998. That that distillate is quite fruit driven. Um, mm -hmm. It it can have a, a kind of citrus element to it. It's not as not as lemony or as as fresh as I find in Kalila, but it, it certainly has a kind of fleshy fruit note. Mm -hmm. If you compare that to say more slightly more modern Lafroig, which tends to me to me to be a bit more ashy. Um, it still has fruit, but it tends to be kind of banana or even foam bananas, that, that, that kind of sweetness to it. Yeah. Um, that for me probably wouldn't fall into the, the realm of elegant. It wouldn't fall into the realm of this, of, of why I think I have in my glass here. So uh, I, I kind of look at the, the distilleries, but then I also look at the distillate styles of particular times. And I think, okay, how does that fit in with our, with what we want to show as, as this kind of, slightly softer style of Isla whiskey. And I certainly think mm. you find that from the stories such as the Freud and Kalila and, and Bernahaven, um, particularly when you start looking at maturation and wood maturation and how you can alter flavors using wood. Yeah. So, so speaking of that, you know, the, the color on, on this 110, it, it's really pale. Yeah. And, and, you know, most people buy with their eyes. Now, granted, you know, the Port Eskeg bottles, they're, they're dark bottles. You, you can't really see the, the color of the liquid inside. But when you pour it, you think, where's the wood in all this? However, when you taste it, um, it it's bursting with, with fruity flavors and, and uh, the, you know, slight pepper. And there is a bit of oak influence and 
So I guess the the question that I'm trying to get to is why why isn't there a lot of color with this one? Is is it because you're using refill casks? And if and if that's the case, why are you targeting refill casks instead of say second fill or first fill to get a bit more wood going on in in the one ten? So for one ten, it is all refill. Um, refill American oak. Some are more active than others, right? So, when you're buying when you're buying whiskey in the secondary market, um, there's a couple of misnomers. One, um, on one, we're, we're not able to go and look at every single cask of whiskey before we purchase it. That's you know, you don't wander around a warehouse saying, "I want that one." Um, <laughs> that, that's not how it works. It's also just so I'm covering off the other side. It's not true that the distillers only sell you the rubbish. Frankly, they have thousands upon thousands upon thousands of casks and they largely have no idea what they will taste like um, and they sell them off in bulk right so they mm -hmm. these casks have never been touched but what they when you look at a story like Kalila they have a um, they have a very specific wood policy from the, the parent company from Diageo which is that they fill a lot of malt into refill casks they fill it into refill or slightly older wood because it for them uh, as a blending house it's an effective way of keeping distillate character so that you can keep different styles from different places, mm -hmm. which are blending, and that makes a lot of sense. Um, now, for a lot of whiskies, you might say, well, it, it needs that sweetness, it needs the vanilla. But for something like Kalila, which is what we're using here, it's such a sweet, fruity spirit. Um, I, I really dislike, um, I dislike this thing that goes round and round that, 80% of the flavor in a whiskey is the wood, or 60% is the flavor in the wood. It's all rubbish, right? There is no set percentage. Hmm. If, if, if a scientist can show me how they've po possibly gone across the, what, currently sitting in Scotland, I don't know, um, a million casks of whiskey and checked to see how many um wood tannins are imposing flavor how many you know which compounds have come from wood versus spirit and mm -hmm. show me that it is always above 60 percent um I, I just don't i don't see that what i do know is that spirit character and that you know this is a, a personal thing i love spirit character if you have the right spirit in refill wood it shines and it will shine young or old if you have much heavier characters so if you take something like Mort Lack or Lagavulin, um, where it's a much richer, heavier character, then maybe you do need a bit more wood. Maybe you do need a bit mm -hmm. more wood to balance that out. But each spirit should be treated differently and, and it, it should be viewed in that way that depending on what you're trying to create depends on the type of wood you use. Um, now, we've historically used refill wood and that being completely blunt, the reason we started using refill wood is because that was what was on offer. So when we started Port of Skate now, coming up to 12 years ago, we were we were sold, we were sent samples, uh, represented samples of seven, eight, nine, ten year old Kalila in in refill. Mm -hmm. And we said, This is beautiful, we should bottle it. Because why wouldn't you? The, we didn't even think about color. That's great. That wasn't, that wasn't even a consideration. I, I say this I, I, a lot of people won't believe me, but if you look at some of the older bottles of Port Escape, it didn't used to say there's no added color. It didn't used to say it's non-chill filtered. It didn't used to say anything. And it was not because we did those things. It's very simple. We didn't even think about it. It wasn't even a consideration. Why would we? And it took someone starting in our company, um, Mr. Mr. Maven, who formerly of Compass Box, to go turn to me and say, you know, you really should start telling people the things that you're not doing. Um, which is still really an odd concept. You know, we're in the, probably one of the few industries where you have to tell people what you didn't do. That's right. right. I find a really odd kind of thing. Yeah, <laughs> no, I didn't add any color to this. Um, I mean, also, it's fairly clear that I didn't add any color because it's very clear. So. Well, you know, if, uh, it, I think there are some countries, Germany, is it, where you have to, you have to write if you did add caramel coloring but if you don't add caramel coloring, then you don't have to mention it. Is that? Yeah, pretty much. You, well, you, you said you never have to mention if you didn't add it. So yeah. you don't. You don't have to write that on a bottle. That's a choice. It's a. It's a marketing choice. 
yeah. um, because it's important to some customers. I do understand why it's important. I, I completely get why not adding color is a, is is of a benefit because I we don't add color for a reason, right? Mm -hmm. But um, I I think the I certainly think the the German system of saying that you have to put what you did do on a bottle is probably <laughs> probably a marginally more sensible rule of thumb. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, we we had uh, just a quick question that came up, and and I think that this is it's a good question because I I see there are people from from your side of the pond here as well, so this is a, a pertinent one from Brian Devorit. Uh, long story short, here w why are we getting the one ten and and. The rest of the world is getting the hundred proof. Why not just do a hundred proof for everybody or a hundred and ten proof for everybody? Uh, well, because you threw that tea in the water in Boston, and we still haven't forgiven you, so we lowered your ABV. Um, it, was a, it was a three percent tax you tried to impose on us, Ali. I'll remind you, three <laughs> percent. Uh, <laughs> You're right. You're right. You had every right to throw it away. I'll I'll hide, I'll put your alcohol up. And um, the reason is the the US has pretty strict rules when it comes to uh, the proof system there. So what you label on the bottle. So for instance, if I put hundred proof bottles as I have them in the UK, they're hundred proof in the UK is fifty seven point one percent or fifty seven point three, depending on who you ask. Um, and I couldn't put that into the US. So. You, when we decided to launch in the US, we knew we couldn't write 57.1% 100 proof. And we also didn't want to put 57.1% and then have to do some really silly maths to give you a really stupid number that made no sense at all to anyone. So we, we toyed with doing it as 100 proof in the US, but then it would only be 50% alcohol. Um, and I tried it and I, it just wasn't as lively. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't mm -hmm. as fresh and clean. Um, so I tried it at 55%, which is 110 proof in the US. Um, and for me, if I'm being brutally honest, I actually prefer it 55 to 57.1, but don't tell anyone in the UK that. Um, <laughs> I, just, I just think that slight addition of water tends to make it shine. Um, when we're bottling them, they are the same batch. So we'll take, uh, like one batch of casks and we'll break them up and we'll just reduce some slightly more just reduce them down to 50 55 um okay. and and normally the batches when they're bottled up when they're when they're, they're racked up into the vat uh, just for clarification they do come out normally about 58 to 59 percent so we we reduce both batches it's just one we reduce slightly more um the the proof system if if anyone's interested in this, I can tell you a lovely story that is is definitely made up. By the way, you know, caveat, lots of caveats because I also do some work on rum and I get beaten up if I use this story in rum. Oh, um, right. So um, the the two different proof systems um, that you have your imperial proof system and your, your US proof system. The reason they differ in in ABV is is actually just because you decided that at some point in in your history you just decided that one day 100 proof would be 50 percent um slightly less romantic story to the one i was going to tell um the the origins of proof they say it comes down to gunpowder so the the almost certainly there is some truth in that when they used to add gunpowder to alcohol and set it alight it would be um foolproof or it would be proof and then it was okay to drink or it was okay to to use or trade, right? So mm -hmm. you're just checking that the ABV was high enough. But they weren't using it. There was no measurement, like, as we know today. Yeah, sure. Um, but the story I used to tell and have told many, many times uh, in the US, um, I'm still waiting to get something thrown at me uh, for this, is that the, the real change was to do with the fact that you guys always used French gunpowder, which is a lot more efficient which is why you managed to kick us out of your country. Well done for that, by the way. Um, and, uh, and you know, bullets fly further. But on the plus side, our shit gunpowder means we get higher alcohol. So, you know. <laughs> so none of that is real, that, that story? It's that not. No, I've been oh. telling that story for years. 
I did always caveat with this is probably not real. Um, wow, I feel I feel as if I've been I've been living a lie this whole time. God damn it! <laughs> um, it looks like you're about to pour what I'm about to pour. Is that the is that the eight year old? I'm actually just trying hundred proof next to the one ten. Oh, okay. So, so I didn't have a bottle of one ten, um, but I had the most recent VAT sample. Um, and it's it's been a kind of weird year, not surprisingly. I'm sure it's been a weird year for everybody. Um, what we've done with 100 Proof and 8-Year-Old over the last few years is we moved the casks over to the warehouse, uh, to the bottling hall, mm -hmm. and then I go up to Scotland and I check all the casks before we vat them because something I said to you earlier, when you buy, like, casks of whiskey when you buy a lot of casks of whiskey you don't always know exactly what you're getting right so sometimes the wood will just say reefer wood and mm -hmm. then you turn up and you find out it's a reefer sherry hogshead and it's a completely different beast yeah sure so we've always gone up and checked but obviously this year um we, we couldn't we couldn't do that um so we had a, we've had a couple of vattings this year because we still need to bowl um, and we get the VAT sample, and now it is pretty much Russian roulette. So when the VAT sample comes in, we open up, check it, make sure we're happy with it, and then we go to bottle. And I've got I've got a couple of alternative ideas if it all goes wrong, um, which it has done in rum, but not in whiskey. So, huh? Okay. So, okay. So to that point, I, I was going to ask you about about the blending process. So let's let's imagine a world where 2020 never happened yeah uh or or maybe better yet covid never happened and, and we're living our lives as if we can just go anywhere and maybe bump into someone and and, and not be scared that that they may have killed you um you know 14 days later like what what does what does the whole process of getting cast samples working on the blend like take us take us through that step by step what what it looks like for you so so there are two aspects to that and um i guess one one is probably more appropriate for when we're talking about 12 year olds later on okay. um but for core range we don't we don't get the car samples down to the the office so if we're working on a small batch of something we will get car samples of everything we're looking at um and then i'd love to give you a say it was scientific and complex but i literally just sit there going like that and pouring stuff into glasses and going oh yeah that, that's kind of nice <laughs> oh, oh no that's shit that's shit um i've been doing that in my house this year my wife thinks i'm mental um <laughs> she wouldn't be wrong for, for core range so for eight year old and hundred proof we move roughly speaking a batch is between 50 and 60 casks um and warehouses charge you for samples, so they charge you for your own whiskey, um, sure. and they and and it becomes quite expensive. So, if, to give you an example, if I was doing a batch of eight year old, a batch of hundred proof, and I needed to order one hundred and twenty samples at fifty pound a pop, mm -hmm. that's an expensive mission. Um, so, instead, as I said, we we fly up to Scotland because we worked out my bar bill and the pop still was was cheaper um a bit not <laughs> not much but it, it was still cheaper so um what we then do is we'll fly up to the bowling hall and we literally just open every single cask and it takes about roughly speaking an hour and a half to do 60 casks probably less than that um less than that if it's raining you know mm. tend to be a lot quicker because uh, we don't have a space inside so we have to do it outside um and basically all I'm doing is opening up each cask and I'm checking for color. I'm checking for, obviously I'm nosing it to check that it smells how we're expecting it to smell. Um, and actually all I'm looking for are two things. One, is it faulty in any way? I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not looking for, I'm not looking to write down tasting notes in every cask because that would be mental. And um, certainly couldn't do that in the time I had. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm looking for any faults. And then when I smell something that's interesting, I will try it. And if it's outstanding, I will pull it out. And I'll pull it to one side and we'll go and look at it later because we might do it as a single cask or small batch. Ah, uh, okay. Yep. But, but largely, Kalila, which we're using for the core range, is incredibly consistent. So we don't really have that. We, we, I don't think I've ever pulled anything out because it was duff ever. Mm, okay. Uh, I can think of. Um, the, for the kind of small batch 
things we are where we tend to try and it's a mixture of looking at the stock we're holding um looking at the the kind of the conceptual stuff um we work the wrong way around so i think a lot of the big companies what they'll do is they'll have a marketing team who will say there's a gap in the market um, customers want this mm-hmm. um we we don't do that we probably should do that but what, what we do instead is we look at the stocks we've got um and i'm tasting all the time so we're getting samples in all the time at the moment in any given week i'm probably trying anywhere between 50 and 100 cask samples at the moment, especially at the moment because we're building up to next year. Um, and all the time we're trying that stock and we're looking at the ages and then we're saying, okay, well, where does that fit? And yeah. when would we bottle that? And how would that look in, in our range? Um, and then sometimes you make a mistake like I did this year and you get all the ages wrong and then you have to come up with some fantastic marketing uh, to make that look okay. <laughs> Uh, do you do you do what what I well I, I think this is traditional. Um, you know, you hear the stories about blenders who will go through all of their cast samples. They take them down to twenty percent, and and then they work with them at that at that really low ABV. Do you do that, or are you working with the cast strength samples? Um, no, I will. I pretty much always work. Uh, certainly initially with cast strength samples, uh, I guess that comes from the fact that we're not, you know, I'm, I don't, I don't come from a blending background. I'm not, I wasn't, uh, sadly trained by, by any, uh, by any pressure professional blend. I was trained by, uh, my boss in his office drinking very old, incredible whiskeys. <laughs> um, and actually I was listening to your podcast the other day with uh, with Cara Lang and something she said it is absolutely true. You know, you, you just get used to drinking car strength whiskey to the extent that when you start trying forty percent stuff, you go, "Where is it?" Yeah, I've got nothing. It's just um, flaccid. Yeah. Um. So no, I don't tend to reduce. Certainly, when I'm doing car samples, what I will do is I'll always add water. So there's always a point at which I'll start reducing it down to see how the whiskey changes. Mm. Um, and I do that for two or three reasons. As one, I'm I'm looking to see if there is anything I'm missing because there are certain flavors that, that pop up. I sometimes get this kind of cardboard you note know, that really comes out with water, and that I've decided tells me that the wood's shite basically and needs everything needs um, needs need to rewrap the cask. Um, and then I'll be also looking at bottling strength, whether it's a single cask or a batch or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, for the bigger vats, so anything we're doing for Port Escague, we are, we are always looking at with water because what I've learned is when you vat cast together, they tend to settle much better together with with the addition of water, or mm. almost always. So I'll start looking at water reduction um, or what point uh, the, the vat comes together. So you, you'll do water reduction during the tasting and then you'll do water reduction into your bench sample and you'll leave it and you'll come back to that two or three weeks time because you need time to integrate might even add water to that again to see what happens um but i ne- i would never say that i've taken anything down to say 20 percent to see how it behaves mainly because okay. i also think that none of my customers are ever going to drink it at 20 percent. that's it's just I, yeah yeah it's not fair. So I, I, had a, I had a question about about the eight year old, but before I do, there is a, a good question. Well, there have been a lot of questions coming in, which we will get to. So everybody who's, who's watching, I see your questions. We're definitely going to get to them. Um, but but one I think is is apropos to the current subject here, and this is from Vlad Metric. You know how. how I mean, he said it in a cheeky way, but but there is there is something to be said for palate fatigue. And so, how do you how do you deal with that when you're tasting through sixty cask samples? So, I should stress, I probably don't. Uh, I'm not drinking sixty cask samples because I would be dead. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think there is a certain amount of. It depends on the spirit, right? So something that's very clean, 
like if you take um, one ten or eight year old, um, I actually think of eight year old as a sorbet, right? I, I would stick that in the middle of any tasting to freshen up your palate. Mm. Although it's smoky, it's just so clean. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. frankly, that's that never really, I never really have an issue um, tasting Kalila uh, ever um, repeatedly. Um, lots of water, obviously. Um, and I smell my hand. I, I do a lot. I do a lot of smelling my hand. Yeah, Not because it smells nice, but it's a nice way of correcting yourself. Um, it, other whiskies. So I, I'm very fortunate that as part of my part of my job, I look after our Japanese stocks, um, which are largely in sherry and old. Um, and yeah, you can try about four car samples before your palate's dead. Mm. And then you're done pretty much for the rest of the day. You know, you just give up. Um, I did a fantastic thing the other day. I had to work on the liqueur, which I hated. Um, but I also then had to show what I'd worked on on the liqueur and uh, a sample of 47-year-old Kurosawa that I was working on a recasking project to skin. I was like, it's jeopardy. One of these is going to destroy your palate. Which way do you want to go? Um, <laughs> Life sounds hard for these forty-seven-year-old Karazawas. Yeah, uh, you know what? It's it's not bad. It's it's not too witty. Um, once we've done a bit of adjustment and left it for another two or three years. <laughs> so with the with the eight-year-old, um, you know the 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 one ten was very bright, very citrusy, really engaging, but also I think it it drank a bit lower than the fifty-five percent that it was. Mm -hmm. where, where the eight-year-old it is it is that sorbet that you talk about but it's also really soft yeah. and and almost almost too easy and so i'm wondering if you could if you could share the differences as far as ages go obviously with the with the eight eight-year-old it's got to be at least eight years old but are there differences in casks and does the abv lend the difference it lend to the differences as well so there's certainly so the differences in age is that the minimum age in eight-year-old is is eight so it tends to be eight nine and ten um mm -hmm. uh we are an independent bottler so we embrace the batch right and i i actually think this is true of almost every scotch whiskey company there's, there's very few companies who i think really do consistency in terms of bottling as well as they say they do um, and as a whiskey fanatic, I think batch is really important. I think vintage is really important. Um, so in each batch that we do of eight year old or, or 110, um, they will contain a different age range because it's completely dependent on the stock we're sitting on. Um, you know, I, I try to keep our stocks in terms of our stock planning. We work about five years ahead so that there should be a certain amount of evenness in there, but you do get issues. So as an example, um, eight-year-old has some older whiskey in it because in 2000 uh, or for 2011, um, we, bought, we bought the same amount of spirit, but when it landed, for some unknown reason, it was sold, it landed in sherry butts, refill mm -hmm. sherry butts, some of which are, are very light, but some of which are very dark. And so basically, having checked some of those samples, we decided we couldn't use any of that vintage. Or I think we only had, we had a very small amount of hogsheads in there. But, but the majority of that vintage we couldn't use in an eight-year-old. So suddenly, we went from having, when we were going to be using eight-year-old whiskey, we didn't have any. So we'd have to we'd use a tiny bit of eight and then lots of nine and a, and a lot of 10. And obviously that was different to the year before. So that, that changes every batch. We're, there's always an alteration. So if you pick up two bottles of Port Skeg 8 and you put them next to each other, there will be differences. Um, not radically. It's not gonna it's not gonna be so much so that you don't like it, but you know, I, I'm the sad person that has all of the lot numbers. So each time it's gone through the bottling room, we keep all the lot numbers so we can check them. Yeah. So we can see those differences. Um the difference with 110 and an eight-year-old, apart from that, is that 110 is seven. Youngest whiskey in there is seven as a rule. 
And mm -hmm. that actually might change in the future because I've been doing some fun stuff with wood. So we might do six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We'll see. Okay. Um, but we, at the moment, it's that seven kind of largely seven, eight, nine, and sometimes ten, but very rarely. An eight year old is eight, nine, and ten. And depending on the batch, depends on how much older stock. Um, obviously, the addition of water makes a big difference. Um, leaving it with that water and I, I mean I always find it's a personal thing and I'm not sure you, you it necessarily shows in these whiskies but I find the addition of water and smoky whiskies makes things a bit sweeter a bit richer mm -hmm. um, mainly because phenols carry, phenols carry sugars and they don't like water and they tend to release those sugars so make things a bit richer so that's definitely a big difference and then in terms of cask makeup this does again change batch to batch, but historically, eight year old has tended to contain a little bit of dechar rechar. Uh, so that's a lot of the wood we got through where it's um, the, the casks got to a point they've probably been third time used and then they've been taken. Um, the insides have been scraped out and they've been recharged and they become a little bit more active, a little bit sweeter, a little bit richer. Is it, and are you doing that recasking yourself of, of putting the spirit into dechar rechar? We are now, so historically, eight-year-olds had that in it just by luck, right? So we would get these casks in, and I'd be like, oh, well, put that to one side, or pull that to one side. Mm. We'll use those for eight-year-old. Because um, we wouldn't find out until we went to look at the casks. You, you see the history on the side of them, basically. You read the, you can, you can see all the stenciling. Um, now, we actually do an awful lot of re-racking. So I think we've just finished a project like this week of, of recasking something like a thousand casks of, of various oh, makes okay. we've done the same for the last couple of years and we do a variety of stuff in there we're not i don't do too much uh, what i would call tutti frutti stuff we don't do too much wine or whatever um, yeah so we come across wine casks coming across an increasing number of wine casks at the moment um but dechar rechar i use quite a lot because it it's a fan fantastically effective way of adding in just slightly more vanilla and slightly sweeter notes, but without overpowering everything. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's great. And it, a question came in, and it's it's perfect timing for, for this discussion here. And actually, before I bring it up, I'm going to switch my pour to the 12-year-old spring edition. There's also the the autumn edition which I don't have in my house because I think it just hit our warehouse maybe oh maybe not not in time for me to get a bottle so so I'm pouring the spring edition um but this question came up from Reginald Ritter who uh who who listened to the One Nation Under Whiskey podcast uh, the one where the the pigeon smashed our window <laughs> and uh and, and, and actually, he brings up a, one of the subjects that I loved the most where you talked about oxygen in the cask. But right here, you know, have you, have you found the need to recast the whiskey? And, and do you, when you recast the whiskey, do you leave room for oxygen to do a little, do a little work? Um, honestly, I'm not thought about it. Probably should. It's a really good point. I'm going to steal that and go do that tomorrow um so so normally well it completely depends on the recasting so, and it depends why you're doing it so if you're doing one single cask then yes absolutely because you're just going to pull one cask over into another right and you'll end up with the same amount of of air um the thing with oxygen and, and aging whiskey in it and this is also being brutally honest it is fantastic for for changing flavor and i can show lots of examples of that it also costs you vast sums of money, right? Because you lose more spirit more quickly, right? So the more space you've got in there, the worse things get. Mm -hmm. And if you, although, you know, I'm very lucky that largely I'm completely allowed to be driven by flavor. And as, a, as a business, we don't, I don't really have any pressure to, um, to do things the most cost effective way. I have to do things the way that make, make the best whiskey so my boss is happy. But that being said, um, when, when you're doing kind of a big recasking operation, you're normally looking at, okay, as an example, 
um, if you've got some wood, and I, uh, as I said earlier, sometimes you get this kind of cardboardy note. You, mm. that, I don't know if you ever got that, Joshua. You got that kind of like. Yeah, it's kind of. It's. I've always associated that cardboardy note with with faints, right? There's there's a bit too much tails in the spirit, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> no, I think I'm talking about a different one. But yes, that I know that flavor too. Um, okay. There's there's this. It's almost like a flat. You can't say something. It tastes flat. I don't know if mm. there's no real good way of describing that. Um, so I'll quite often recast that into something slightly more active. Now, if I'm doing that, I'm doing it to bring in vanillins and sweetness. I'm not really doing it to bring in, say, the fruit that you would get from the extra oxygen. Um, you're going to get that with time uh, by leaving the cask and it emptying out. Mm -hmm. um, so I've never artificially tried to do that. I, as I said, I think it's a really interesting idea, um, but the, the problem then you do have is that you will lose ABV really quickly, and yeah. you'll lose you'll lose a lot of quantity. So it's a it's a lovely risky game. Um, yeah, that that's a good point. Um, talk to us about this twelve year old. You know if. If you described the eight, and, and again, I've got the 12-year-old spring edition. If you described the eight-year-old as sorbet, yeah. it's stop, that eight-year-old is no longer sorbet because this 12-year-old has completely taken over. It's just so fresh and fruity. And well, it's got this kind of passion fruity thing in it as well. And yeah. it, it, it's funny because it, that conversation really does tie into this. So when when we did 12 year old the whole point this year was we were going to have a 12 year old that's where i started the the whole conversation back in 2019 we we'd done the 10 year old uh, for the 10 year anniversary um and then i was looking at the stocks and planning out what we could do and i said you know what i could do a, i could do a big batch of 12 like the old days because we used to have a 12 year old as a standard mm -hmm. uh, standard range i said i could try and recreate that i loved that whiskey i actually poured that at my wedding I thought, I'd, let's try and recreate that, but let's try and make it a little bit richer, and we'll use some of these, these sherry butts we've got. Um, and then I, I went off, and I said, right, that's what we're doing. And then Andrew, who's my my ops manager, and he's, uh, he, he's from Campbelltown. He's brilliantly blunt. Um, he pointed out that I'm an idiot, that uh, it's very difficult to release something in March as a 12-year-old when about – Two thirds of your stock doesn't turn twelve until August. Um, right. So I then went back to the stocks and I looked, and, and we had essentially two sets. We had some two thousand and six and two thousand and seven, which were all refill hogsheads, um, and then we had the two thousand and eight, which some were refill hogsheads and some were sherry butts. And mm -hmm. We broke it into two batches. So the, the twelve year old spring is all oh six and oh seven hoggies. And when we pulled the, the casks um, over, when we pulled the samples, some were a little bit fruity than others. We didn't get them re-gauged, which we probably should have done, but hey-ho. Um, when we got them pulled over to the warehouse, I actually went round with our brand ambassador, Julie Hamilton. Uh, it's the first time she'd ever, ever, she was really eager to go round and, and do cask tasting before bottling, I think. Like everybody had this idea, it was really romantic, and then we turn up in this industrial state in Dumbarton, and you know, watching people pour whiskey into a into a uh, tip um, because it was too young and all that kind of nonsense. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so that loses its sheen a little bit. But as we were going around the cask, we suddenly realised the really fruity ones, similar to what we were saying before, were were essentially a third full, if that, like really low yield cask. Wow. Okay. And so. Yeah. You know, we stood there and Julie's like, do we do we include those or not? I'm like, yes, 100% yes, because that's going to yeah. give you all of the fruit, um, even though it obviously makes everything more expensive, but it's it's just delivering so much more flavor. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel that's the kind of backbone in this, and that's why this has that that slight richer fruit it's, that is it's still fresh and clean, but it's got yeah. that, that brightness to it. Um, it reminds me a little bit, yeah, as you're describing it, it reminds me a little bit of the the BW4, the Elements of Isla, Bowmore, the fourth release, where, where you mentioned you had a bunch of casks that were really low fill. Oh, and it, well, actually, yeah, it was only one, and that was... I oh, think it was just the one. 
one and we had 20 liters. I looked back on that the other day, we had 20 liters, but it was just the most intense tropical juice you've ever tried. And this is similar, right? like it was probably more than 20, 20 liters in this. I mean, it was, you're probably talking about 50, 50 bulk, um, which yeah. is, it's, it's pretty low. I mean, you know, as a single cask, you'd be pretty depressed if you, if you paid, you paid for 150 liters of alcohol, you know, probably about 300 mm. or, you know, 250 bulk liters and ended up with 50 liters. You'd be, you'd be pretty sad. Um, but in this situation, you kind of go, well, okay, uh, it'll even itself out, kind of. Um, okay, the cost's a bit higher, but the flavor profile's absolutely amazing. There, um, a comment came in from Bill Myers, and, and I'll bring it up, and it goes back to your cardboard taste here. So Peter Silver, I'm not sure if you uh, know know that name. He's, he's the, the jazz dentist who owns... Uh, uh, Dram Central Station, that, that's what his house yeah. is called. Um, now, Peter says he attributes the cardboard taste to oxidation, but I, I would argue, and, and I wonder if you would agree, that there's a difference between oxidation of whiskey mm. that's in a bottle as compared to oxidation of whiskey in cask. Yeah, 100%. Um, and I, uh, there's a lot of things there. When, when you get into the bottles, it's all that closures and... <sighs> There, there's so many elements to that in a bottle and the changes of flavor in a bottle and the OBE effect and what the OBE effect is and what that tastes like and what it, you know, yeah. whether it's good or bad. You know, if you, well, not, not to go into too much detail because it's obviously got nothing to do with what we do, but um, if you look at OBE in a, in a bottle with a, a spring cap, mm -hmm. um, you know, I remember opening a whole series of Jewish white labels with spring caps from the 50s. And it was hit and miss. Like some of them were good, and some of them tasted like tin. Yep. Now, yep. You'd know it. You, you would never get cardboard off that, but you would get tin, even if the level was low. Um, but maybe on some of the corks we've had, cork bottles we've had, old bottles where the levels have been a bit low, then mm -hmm. yeah, I've got cardboard. And I, I personally think it's probably coming from something to do with the cork, or again, possibly, you know the way the whiskey is reacting in the bottle. Um, I also tend to find that it tends to be when the ABVs are low at the start. So when they're 40% whiskeys, um, tend, uh, tend to work out badly. But okay. uh, that's my limited experience. You know, I don't, I don't work with old bottles day to day. It's, it's a hobby, not a, not a job. I'm not going to say sadly, I like my job. So, <laughs> so uh, before let's, before we pour the 18 year old, which I haven't opened yet, I've been waiting for the right occasion to open it. And I think drinking with you is the right occasion. But I'm before I'm, I yeah, go ahead, I'm pouring 12 year old autumn, just so you know. Just so, and, th and that's what I wanted to talk about. What What's the difference between the autumn versus the, the spring? So, um, autumn was all 2008 stock. Mm -hmm. Some of it was refill hogsheads. Um, the exact breakdown I am rubbish with. I, I'm pretty sure it's something like 50% or 55% is refill hogsheads. And then um, I want to say 30, 20 or something like that. Um, basically, we recast a load of a load of stock that we were bottling for Port Escape, actually right at the beginning. So I was looking through my, my notes on this. I think this might have been my second batch of 100 proof that I ever produced. So this is probably mm. back in 2015 or 2016. And we used to buy uh, we used to buy the whiskey in, in a container, right? So they would dump the casks for us at the warehouse and they'd dump mm. it into a container and they would be delivered to the bottling hall and they were run for the bottling line. It was a really simple, nice, easy way of doing it. Um, however, we had less control. Um, and so what I used to do is I would take off a portion of the vat and I would re-rack it. Um, okay. Um, so I, I took off a portion of that vat. I had, I had some in reefer hoggies and then I took off a portion. Originally it was going to go into these, these sherry butts that Sekindo had sourced from a friend of his. Mm -hmm. And these sherry butts were, um, were from a Solera system that had been broken down, but they didn't arrive in time. So I bought some some sherry butts from uh, Miguel Martin, uh, mm -hmm. which you know a lot of people in whiskey will have come across. He, 
Uh, Miguel Martin is a producer, uh, Cooper of Wood, a producer of Sherry as well, who produced Wood for all sorts of people in the Scotch whiskey industry, but notably Glenn Farkless, Abelauer, Kilhoman, you know, some of the biggest names um, and some of the best Sherry matured whiskies. Sure. Um, and I'd met him on a Glenn Farkless trip a few years prior. Um, so we bought some Oloroso Sherry butts from him and um, we re-racked some of the whiskey into that. And then later in the year, we finally got these Solera butts in. So we re-racked some more into these Solera butts. And oh. So the difference there is that when Miguel produces wood, what he's doing is he's producing wood for the maturation of Scotch whiskey. So that what they'll do is they'll cooper a cask, they'll fill it full of cherry uh, or sacrificial wine for two years uh, mm -hmm. about, uh, or a year. And then, then they'll replace that with sherry. So Oloroso, whatever you want for 18 months. And then that gets dumped and then you get the wood. And what that means is you've got a fantastically active, really kind of imposing wood that's actually really consistent. It gives you these kind of gingery. For me, it's, it's all about kind of ginger cake ginger rich sweet flavors things that you actually associate with sherry um, now ironically the solera sherry butts which had real sherry in them maturing uh, for probably 50 to 70 years um wow. Wow. did not take anything like that um they they tasted kind of mushroomy and slightly uh, like, like forest floors um but we did that because because it was interesting um yeah. And no one in Scotch whiskey was doing it. So we knew we knew of one independent bottler who was doing it, who we bought the butts off, a uh, distiller in the Netherlands who was doing it. And then we later found out Diageo had done it for Talisker once as a finish. <laughs> Apart from that, nobody. Be, but the reason they didn't do it, in my opinion, because uh, of all the things I discovered, was one, if you don't cooper the casks properly, uh, it's like pouring whiskey into a sieve. Mm -hmm. um, and they tend to leak um so that's not great good good way of losing a lot of money um and two they don't deliver that sweetness that people are associating with a with a wine that's extensively a dry wine so you know it ended up in some ways it was a failed experiment we didn't end up with like 20 sherry butts of kalila that were all yeah. outstanding we ended up with 20 sherry butts that all needed there were fantastic components. So autumn has a little bit of that in it, but it's it's also got, uh, uh, like the larger sherry portion is is Miguel Martin. So I've got that sweetness and richness there. Mm -hmm. um, but very much in my mind, because I'd I'd come up with this stupid idea of doing spring and autumn because the, eight, the 2006, 2007 was so fresh and clean. And we were like, well, that's definitely spring. So then I was saying, yeah. well, I've, I've got to make autumn now. Um, so I, I went back to the sherry butts because of that kind of autumnal forest floor idea. And I, I was like, I, I really like that. I want, I want that flavor. Um, and hopefully we've balanced that. So certainly the flavors I find in it is I, I do get that richness and chocolate um, that I associate with going into winter. Mm -hmm. um, I do get that kind of mushroomy uh, mm -hmm. note, slightly umami note. Um, um, but it still maintains some of that freshness and cleanness that I always associate with Kalila and, and the elegance I associate with Poesky. That's brilliant. Um, just uh, apropos to this, to this, um, convert or this part of the conversation here, and I'm going to elaborate on this a little bit. What makes, what makes the wood active? W would you say it's, you know, usually when I talk about a cask being an active cask, I often I often compare a cask to to a tea bag, right? First fill cask is going to be more active, just like the first time you use a tea bag, that cask is going to be more active. Second fill, a little less active. You have to put keep the whiskey in there a bit longer to get a bit more color. Still, the flavor would not be the same as it would compared to maturing the whiskey and first fill and, and so on and so forth. And you can go down the line. Would you yeah. say that that's accurate or? I say that's, uh, no, I'd say that's absolutely accurate. But I mean, I, I guess there's lots of levels you can be in that. Right. So 
whenever you're saying something is active, you're saying it's it's giving you something. Like right? it's it's, mm. it's a very generous piece of wood. It's generously giving you something. And depending on how you've treated that wood, um, so uh, as simple as as you said, it, it's the first time it's been used. It's the second time it's been used. Well, it's the first time it's been used and it was only used for three years and then the second time it was used for 10 years etc cetera, etc cetera. depends on how much that would be sure. yeah but like everything in whiskey is we we love to simplify um because it, it makes it nice and easy for customers to understand and, and hang their hat on on a peg and say i like this i like that I like simple mm. stuff but the reality is we're dealing with with lots of moving parts so you could take if you take American oak, bourbon barrels, um, toasting, charring, all these things change how active or how how interactive your spirit and wood is. Hmm. Okay, um, and it changes the kind of flavor profile you're going to get. Um, and you can make something more active by changing, as you as we talked about earlier, by like recharring it, retasting it, so you can yeah. get something that wasn't very active and make it active. Um, and it's it's just about the interaction between spirit and wood and how much flavor that wood is giving you. And sometimes that's a really good thing, and sometimes it's a bad thing. <laughs> and that's the other thing. You don't – not to get caught into the idea that active wood is always a positive. Sometimes it's great. Sometimes your spirit needs sweetening up or it needs something, but sometimes it just adds layers of flavor that you didn't want, and it hides everything else, and you've got to okay. wait for it to go away. Um yeah, no, I, this is something that, that, that Jason and I have always talked about. And, and one of the reasons why, you know, I, I think I connected with you in our, in our very first meeting is, is you always talk about the importance of spirit character and not hiding that spirit character that, 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 you know, a big, a big cherry cast whiskey could be wonderful. It could be great, but it could also be anybody's whiskey if you, you know, if you can't figure out where that spirit came from. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, I don't, um, I really don't have an issue with, with active wood or, or people using festival wood programs and that kind of thing. If it's, if it suits their, their purpose and they're making a nice drink, that's great. Um, but Scotch whiskey is special because it's diverse. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I, I have lots of bottles behind me, right? So not just, not just whiskey. I enjoy bourbon, right? I like bourbon. And I have probably a dozen different bourbons upstairs to open mm -hmm. at different occasions. And they're all nice whiskeys. They're all good whiskeys. Mm -hmm. But they're not distinct. I mean, they're, they're distinct in a very small way. Mm -hmm. Um scotch is distinct in a way that no other spirit category is and it, it always makes me feel a little sad anytime you kind of hear companies saying right th we're going to adopt a wood policy of only first full or only you know, first full bourbon or only first full sherry and you're like okay mm -hmm. um but you know you have you have a diverse spirit even in one distillery that you can diversify more and, and then you can use that you can use that as ingredients you, you can start playing you can start playing with lots of flavors. You can create so many things. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Scotch is power. And in a world where people are looking for different, they're looking for things that are new and interesting, is that it, it's so wide, so fast. So we shouldn't shrink it down with uh, wood, 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 wood. We should celebrate spirit character and then celebrate how wood can work with it in, in the, incredible, the incredible array of ways. Beautiful. Now, I think that's a beautiful segue into the next whiskey, um, which is the 18 year old. And, and this, and, and the reason why I think it's a good segue is where, you know, up until now, the, the, the first four whiskeys we've talked about have been a vatting of many casks. Where this 18-year-old, however, is, is one of those casks where you said, wait a second, something really special is happening here. And this ended up being a single cask port gauge. And so, uh, you know, I'm hoping you'll, you'll, you'll take me through this whiskey. This is my first time tasting. I just opened this bottle. Um, and so I'm curious to know 
what you found in this, why this one was separated from, from the rest of the group. So I should stress when the first bottling took place, I had, I think only just started working with the company. So in, in 2009, um, Sikinda decided he was going to make uh, a whiskey called Podeskeg, and he was going to do what was called Podeskeg Car Strength, because he, he, he for his shop, he had room in his shop for a, a Car Strength Isla whiskey. And that's why he started the, the, the whole brand. That was the whole label idea. Um, and then at the time in 2009, the gates were open. You could buy whatever you wanted. Um, you know, as a every now and again, when I want to depress myself a little bit, I go and look through the stock sheets of all our casks and I see how much we used to pay for our bag and the Freud and the more, and, and then and then I can't sleep. Um, <laughs> and at the time, you know, when he started that in 2009, he was told, you know, but you can buy as much Kalila as you want, as much as you want. Um, by 2011, having introduced Potterscape to the world, and it was doing really well, um, the world changed, the market changed, because everybody in whiskey seemed to believe that India was about to explode. You probably remember that, Joshua, you know, that, that period where it was all over the news that, that India was going to start buying whiskey. That mm -hmm. was the thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, they're going to drop the taxes. They still haven't dropped the taxes. I mean, it's, no. <laughs> still waiting for that. Um, and there wasn't enough whiskey because during the early, the late 90s, early 2000s, people didn't make any. So suddenly there wasn't anything to sell and all the mm -hmm. doors closed and everyone started protecting. Um, luckily, Sikinda had bought a lot of, a lot of Kalila and he decided uh, he had enough to do a 12 year old. In fact, I think he decided to do that pretty much the same time the doors closed. Um, mm -hmm. I started with the company in 2011 i think the 12 year old was launched 2012 uh from memory um and that was supposed to be like a standard whiskey again it didn't have non-chill filtered or no coloring it didn't have limited edition it had nothing written on the bowl it was just a standard 12 year old whiskey on the shelf for 40 pounds wow um and and uh when he did the vatting it was a vatting of bourbon barrels and hogsheads um and he went for all the casks. And I think from memory, he picked out two. In the same way that I do today, he picked out two. They thought, these, these are really good. These two are really special. I will leave these. One was a hogshead and one was a barrel. And he said, you know, I'll keep, I'll keep these for something special. Um, so when I started with him on the cask side in 2013, 2014, I was given, given the keys, like go and find stuff, have fun. And I found these two casts of Kalila and I asked about them. He goes, no, don't touch those. Just, just keep those. Just keep those. But, you know, he's become a very busy man. So he's kind of forgotten uh, that these things are even there anymore. And um, I bottled one of them as a single cask, uh, 2000 vintage for France. And, I've tasted that. I remember yeah. that. Yeah. And, uh, and I got some raised eyebrows from, from him. Uh, that was a barrel. And then I had this hogshead, and I've been sitting on that hogshead for a long time. I, I literally have gone back to that hogshead every year, thinking we need to buy this. It's really special. Um, so, you know, we, we I'd had a conversation with with Sam at Impex, and, I'd, and he'd said, I really want something, you know, around 18 years old, <laughs> something special. And I suddenly went, I've got that. <laughs> I got a big mouth. And I couldn't, I couldn't shut up. So I, I offered in this cask. But it, in terms of the wood or anything, there's nothing special, and and that's kind of why I think it's so, why whiskey's so amazing, right? Mm. The cask isn't like um, some some particular type of hogshead that was created by this magical cooper named John, who you know he used wood that was picked from the finest trees, yada yada yada. It was just. It was a really solid, tight cask of whiskey, um, mm -hmm. and it it developed in a way that's slightly different to the one sitting next to it. And it's it's that simple. It's just a slightly different development that could have been just, you know, maybe maybe we were sitting at the doorway and there was slightly more uh, air coming through the door. Who knows? Yeah. Maybe maybe it was a slightly warmer climate. Um, 
but it, it's one of those single casks and you know you know this there are times where you try a, a sample of a single cask whiskey and going this just needs to be bottled on its own it just it needs to be celebrated on its own yep 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 100 percent. this one is is a really dynamic single cask it's there's a note on the nose that I, I don't know if I've ever gotten on a whiskey. Maybe I have. Uh, I'm sure I have, but I, I do. I rarely find it. But it's almost that balsam and fir kind of Christmas wreath yeah. scent going on the nose, and then on the palate, it's it's like a vanilla milkshake, just a slightly smoky vanilla milkshake going on. It's really lovely. Yeah, it's quite dense as well. Mm. Even Kalila, this is kind of a densely packed um, whiskey. And I also get, I get fruit on this in the same way I get fruit on a lot of Kalila, but the difference is it's almost like raspberry or raspberry leaf, you know, you yeah. have that, that slight sweetness to it. Um, and I, yeah, I, I do, I'm really chuffed that we bottled it. Uh, I still kick myself a little bit that I bottled it for you guys because it means I, it's much more difficult for me to get bottles. Um, I mean, that's just a sad reality of it. If I bottled it for the UK, this would be a lot easier. I could have stashed loads of whiskey. Um, but I, I'm chuffed that I bottled it for people who really enjoyed it. I mean, that was also quite nice, was knowing that it was going to people who cared. That was quite important. Wait a second. You you told me you, you steal a case of everything that you bottle. You, you're pretty, I think you're perfectly fine. I really don't know that that's enough whiskey. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> it's also not actually true. We we steal a case of everything we bottle for other countries. Ah, there you go. Okay. For for some stuff, we steal two or three. I mean, like there's. <laughs> I, was, I had this whole thing one day where I realised we should really have an archive, and then I couldn't decide how many bottles go into an archive. And I was like, well, what are you going to use an archive for? Tastings. Well, I might do a lot of tastings. Oh, I'll probably need more bottles. Um, <laughs> yeah. A substantial collection of our own whiskey. Um, we we have some questions coming in, and and I want to get to them. We will have one last whiskey to taste, but I'm enjoying this too much, and I do not want to rush this. And and I I also don't want to to let people know what what's coming next. We have some questions. Actually, before we get to the questions, Kevin Obis had a really good comment, and, and I think it's so perfect here. Uh, my first bar manager told me scotch is like going to a restaurant that has a menu with a thousand items on it. Bourbon is like going to a restaurant that has a, has a thousand men items on it, but they're all hamburgers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I, I should stress, I use, I use bourbon as an example. I, I always used to say, uh, and this was working in a wine shop. I did a brief stint in uh, in, a, in the Odvins wine shop before I went back to specialist whiskey shops. Um, and when people in this wine shop used to ask me to describe what was so important about whiskey, I would always say, "Look, you know, vodka has a has a flavor span of this, and and gin, gin if it's actually gin, is probably about the same as maybe maybe that because it's got." use some other botanicals and stuff um white wine is probably here and, and red wine is here and scotch whiskey is the rest of the room um and anything you can find on the street thrown in it's you know is yeah. so diverse um and it's it's just I, I don't think there's any category in drinks quite like it um for that mm -hmm. yeah. um another question here from reginald um so is, is is all of the port ass gig from Colila and do you I mean we talked about this uh a bit and someone someone else I forget who it was I'll see if I can find the question but in addition to Reginald's question there they also asked you know do, do you ever do any port ass gigs that are just full tilt sherry just big sherry so so the answer to the first one, no, they're not all Kalila because um, although everything we've tasted so far has been Kalila, um, and we do largely, like, you know, we, we, we buy a lot of Kalila. Funny enough, we buy a, a lot of Kalila, and a pretty reasonable amount, but a half, actually. 
Um, but we've also bottled Lafrigue a couple of times um, mm -hmm. with the right vintages. It's kind of what I was saying at the start. If you've got the right ages and the right time point to, to bottle Lafrigue, it can fit into the kind of more elegant uh, fruit-driven styles. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then obviously Benahav, and like I know you said to me before that we got a call, Josh, that you had some 14 year old, which which was Peter Benahav, um, 14 year old bourbon. Um, so that that's like heavily Peter Benahav and called Margadale. Um, we, to the answer to the second question in sherry, so outside of the ones where we've kind of used sherry as an element, and we've done that a few times. The only time we've we've done like full on sherry, there's two occasions that I can think of. I've done a single cask for Germany. Um, mm -hmm. It was Germany, um, and they, they do love they do I love like sherry. sherry. Yep. Um, and then the other one was we did a 15 year old sherry, um, yep. but that was actually a, again, it's not it wasn't full on because it, in some ways I feel like I would be getting away from the idea of elegant Isla if I just went you know smoking smoking sherry. Um, I'm not sure how elegant that would be. It'd be a bit of a beast. Um, but with the 15-year-old sherry, what we did was we took some much older whiskey, some 1997 uh, hogsheads of peated Benahaven, mm -hmm. heavy peated Benahaven, and we married that with 2001 unpeated Benahaven that was in first fill sherry butts. Mm -hmm. We actually took all of that whiskey and we re-racked all of it into Olorosa sherry butts and left it to age on. Um, oh, wow. For a little bit to come together so we yep. we also reduced that was my first water reduction experiment so reduced to 50 percent and see what happens mm -hmm. um and the whole the whole thing was yes i wanted all the richness from the 2001 sherry butts which are very yeah you know, i think you may have tried one joshua in a uh, single malt scotland we did a 18 year old i think last year or the year before um and they're very kind of kind of caramelly dense gingery sherry whiskeys uh, uh -huh. what we didn't want was we didn't want just that so we reduced the abv to try and draw out more vanillins out of the wood because the wood was um 50 american oak this was an interesting find the other day we discovered that a lot of the sherry butts we own are actually 50 percent european oak 50 percent american oak new oh interesting okay um, so we, we reduced the ABV and the idea was that would bring out more wood sugars. Um, yeah. so even that, that 15 year old that says 50 on sherry, I wouldn't call it a kind of full on sherry monster. It's not, uh, and it was never supposed to be because for me, that would probably be a different, that would be a different category of whiskey outside of what we bought for Port Escape. Right. And, and, and that's what I was going to say. And, and by the way, that, that question about, you know, full on, you know, full on sherry or hev heavily sherry have a phone number influence um you know that question came from a dram for all um but but i think you bring up a, a really good point my understanding about port askeg is it's all about the elegance it's all about the balance and you're using the elements of isla range to throw your your big sort of maybe not one-sided Isla whiskeys, but 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 your bigger, maybe not so elegant Isla whiskeys. That that's probably true. Elements of Isla uh, certainly can be more brutal. It doesn't mean we don't we don't try to balance things. I'm a I'm a stickler for thinking that you, you know good food, good drink. If mm -hmm. flavors aren't in balance, then you're not going to enjoy it. But that being said, um, who doesn't love? A kind of greasy, wonderful hamburger. Uh, people do want big, ridiculous flavors. Those, those things are important. Yep. You, you yep. do want that. So, elements of either certainly more of that stuff sits in there. More extreme flavors sit in there, or more obvious flavors sit in there. Mm -hmm. um, but as an example, we did a bottling recently of a, I think it's BN8. I'm running, I'm losing track of my numbers, which is a mixture of five-year-old and seven-year-old Benahaven. Um, the seven-year-old's from Refill, and it's heavily peated. And the five-year-old's in Sherry Hogsheads, they were insane uh, in and of themselves. So we use them to balance out, but it's still a pretty pokey whiskey. I mean, it's mm. strong, it's big, it's in your face. Um, that 
would never have worked for for Port Escape because just the style of whiskey was it's it's too much, too big. Sure. sure. So uh, I want to pour the final whiskey, and I'd love I'd love for you to to share the story about it, and and then we've got um, a, f a few more questions, but. Let me share a picture. So we're pouring the Port Eskeg 45 year old. And just so everybody's aware here, that's not four and five years old. That is 45 years old. Um, and this is, this is a bottle that I treated to myself for my 45th birthday. And uh, I'm down to about a half a bottle left because, I don't know, in 2020, I'm just finding all sorts of reasons. Like, I got to celebrate something, right? Uh, you know, my car started today. Pour some 45-year-old Port Eskeg. Um, I had to catch COVID. Pour some 45-year-old Port Eskeg. Um, you, you can't smell it. And then you go, oh. <laughs> damn it. <laughs> um, but this is... Uh, I'm, I'm going to pour myself a little extra of this because I'm something similar. It's it's just a bottle of of pure magic. It really is a bottle of pure magic. Um, let's talk about this 45 year old, please. So um, it breaks one of the rules that I set for Porsche. So Porsche is almost always peated, right? It's always almost smoky. This is not. This is unpeated. But uh, what it doesn't have in smoke, it makes up in elegance and fruit. Um, way back when, uh, when, when times were hard in whiskey shops, and it's funny because I've actually had this conversation just last week when someone was talking to me about, um, they were talking about Port Ellen. And they were like, oh, um, these close facilities are so expensive. Um, when were they ever cheap? And I was like, well, I remember selling them for like eighty pound a bowl, and they were like, oh, it must have been so easy. And I actually thought about it for a bit, and, I, and actually, it wasn't. You know, it was quite hard work back in two thousand five, <laughs> two thousand six. You'd be having people coming in and be like, no, no it's, it's really worth eighty pounds. Like, just buy the. It's amazing whiskey. And yeah, it's only twenty three years old. <laughs> it's really tasty looking. Who is who, who's Douglas Lang anyway? Oh, you know, and you, you'd be going through all of this, and it it was so hard. Well, in those days, uh, buying whiskey on the in the bulk market was clearly a different world. So, I, you know, as I said earlier, I've got the records of all the stuff Sikindi used to buy from the old days. Um, and sixties whiskey used to turn up, right? So, Sikindi's first ever single cast bottling and the single malt of Scotland was a sixties uh, Tom and Tool, I think, or Tomartin, one of those. So it's it's like Oh wow. You know, it it was it was it I'm not say it was easy, but there was so much stock. And if you look at the independent bottlers back then, your your Duncan Taylors, your Douglas Langs, your you know, uh, your signatories, and you look at what they put into bottle, there was a lot of stock. Mm -hmm. And it was all crazy. And it's not crazy because it was old. It was crazy because of the, the makes and the period of time. Anyway, so Kinder bought a parcel in that in that period of time of Bernahaven from he bought some 68, some 72, 76. Uh, so it was a whole a whole load of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but he bought the, the 68 because well he bought them because they were not a bad price, but he also bought them for a slightly sentimental reason. They were distilled on the hogmany. Which makes them sister casks to a very famous whiskey called Old Acquaintance, Bernahaven Old Acquaintance. Um, and Old Acquaintance was first fill, um, first fill sherry, very dark, very rich, but it was also massively fruit driven. So Sikinda bought these, I'm, I'm pretty sure sight unseen. He, he kept them for a little while. I'm not going to say forgot about them, but he, he didn't really have a plan. He just bought them. He said, oh, you know, we'll, we'll bottle some. We'll do something with them. <laughs> um, and when I started on Port Escago, one of the things I was handed was all these old casks. And by 2014, the strength on, on the 68s 
um, trying to see if I got all my dates right there, um, was down to 41%, 42%. It must be 42, thereabouts. Okay, real low. Um, but the liquid was incredible. Um, and what you have to understand is that the liquid speaks of a time, right? So it's unpeated stock. This is Bernahaven post floor malting closure, but pre Portella malting's opening. So you wouldn't be able to buy peated malt from a big maltster. So if you were buying from a maltsters like they were in 68, 68, they'd be buying from the mainland and it would just be mainland malt unpeated. Mm -hmm. It also moved to unpeated because it was popular, right? So they were making whiskey for blends and people wanted less peated whiskey for their blends. So they were moved to Highland. Highland style whiskies. And that happened at Bernahab and Amber Clad in, I think, around 1960. However, you also have some other kind of key factors. Um, production ebbed and flowed quite a lot. So you'd have everything from the distillery be open seven days, five days, three days. And you'd have longs and shorts in your ferments, but you'd have a lot of longs. And the other thing that's really, really important in this period is it predates distillers yeast. So most of the areas today use, use yeast strains that have been designed for distilling. There, there's multiple strains being used uh, that create different flavors. It is really engineered. It's really clever, like I, and I'm not bad-mouthing any of it. As an example, Bermore, Modern Bermore is one of my favorite whiskeys, and I know they use two different yeast strains to create specific flavors. It's mm -hmm. designed, right? I'm mm -hmm. a great fan of designing great drink. Mm -hmm. That's not what happened in the 60s. They didn't design great drink. They happened to make great drink. You say it's uh, almost haphazard? I, I think there's an element of that. I think there's, there's the tradition. This is how mm -hmm. we do it. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of luck, and there's a lot of adjustment on site. There's a lot of, a lot of skill, like individual skill, but it's a very different skill to the planning to make it does that make sense yeah sure sure you'd run you'd look at your stills you'd look at how you're running them and you would tweak and change all the time and sometimes you have a good day and sometimes you have a bad day and that's mm -hmm. why the whiskeys probably went up and down a bit more uh, okay but the, yep. the ups are unreal and yeah. i love during the 60s is the biggest ups in fact i live from around from anywhere from basically about 55 through to uh, about 77, in my opinion, is, is the, the best man has created uh, for, for anything, including, you know, including the Great Wall of China, including um, anything. Isla is better, right? Isla did it better for, for about a 20 year period. Wow! Yeah, um, I love that. I love that. You, know, you, yep. can, you see that in Bermore. You can you taste the same flavors in the whiskey that we've got here in Bermore. You can taste it in the Froy, right? It's all fruit. It's all tropical fruit, mango, papaya, and then you've got the fact this is Oldwood. So these are all refill sherry butts. They were pretty loose, so lost a lot of liquid. We had mm -hmm. five. Um, we actually married all five together. Broke them back at, into the three best butts, um, which basically tells you we lost two full butts of liquid in, in 45 years. Amazing. Yeah. Um, and the nice thing about that old wood is it does give you another flavor. So one of the things I get from oxygen is mint. Like I get dried mint leaves. Thank you. Yes. Yep. And, and that, so one of the things that I was going to mention, um, <sighs> maybe eight years ago or so, maybe nine, maybe 10 at this point. I, I don't, I don't, I don't know how time works anymore, but back when, when I had a blog, there was um, a group, a Polish group called wealth solutions who started bottling some casks, right? You, I know, you know the name. And one of the earlier ones that they did was a fifth, um, a Glenn Farkless from 1953. Mm -hmm. Right. And it was 58 years old at that. So whatever, whatever that math works out to, I think it was a 58 year old whiskey. And that was the first whiskey ever where I had tasted or, or nosed a massive amount of mint. And then as I started experiencing more 40 year plus old whiskeys, I started finding this mint. 
and and it is hugely present in in the forty five year old. And, and you think that's a function of the of the oxidation in the cask? I do. I I too only really find it on very old whiskies. Um. So it tells me it's probably something more to do with age um, than it is to do with the, the, the distillate. And, you know, one of the interesting things is you can try 60s Isla at 12 years old, right? You can go and buy a bottle of the more dumpy brown. Yeah. Right. And it's got all the same hallmarks as black mm -hmm. or Wow. Or, or okay. the, white, right? so the flavor profile is the same, right? It's the same stuff, wow. but it doesn't have that. Um, and you can do the same with Bernard and you can find early 80s bottles of 12 year old Bernard, which would be distilled in a similar period to this. And it mm -hmm. has fruit, but it's not, um, it, it just doesn't have the same kind of menthol note. So I, I definitely think that's got something to do with either oxygen or the way the wood was produced. But my belief is it's oxygen, so I tend to find it on slightly lower fuel casks. Interesting, we, we bought the 59. A 53 fart plus as well but it was incredibly high strength there is mint on it as well mm. um, but i find more mushrooms and much denser kind of oh interesting yeah um which i don't get on this this is this is all about the the fruit the mint it's, it's a proper tropical fruit salad um and i you know i i obviously i'm biased right i work on port escape all the time it's it's not only being, it's not only something I do and I'm, I'm paid to do, I'm, I've also worked with it for the last, like directly with it for the last seven years and been part of my life for a decade. Um, but this is one of my favorite whiskeys of all time. It's one of those moments where you try something, you just go, yeah, well, that's what I want to drink. It's, um, it, you know, they're, they're those that, that know their whiskey, right? Those that have followed whiskey and especially independently bottled whiskey over the past few decades, you know, there, there are these highly sought after bottlings, which, you know, signatory dumpies, right? Some of the older Samarolis that have just been epic. And, and I would put this up there with some of those epic Samarolis and, and signatory dumpies. They're just, this is an absolutely remarkable dram and I'm contemplating a second bottle because I just poured a lot and now I'm below the halfway point. Um, but part of the reason why I wanted to, wanted to pour this, I mean, A, I get to drink it with a friend and, and with friends watching too, and, and that's a lovely thing. But I think, you know, we, we started off with the, 110 proof that was seven to 10 years old. You have the eight year old that's eight, nine, 10 years old. And then we had an 18 year old single cask. We've done a 25 year old here in the States. Um, and then there's this 45 year old. I, I think that doing it this way just shows the, the, the breadth of, of your range and what you have access to. And it's not just the quality that you have access to, because I think it's all incredibly high quality, but it's just the sheer range of, of ages and makes and cask styles that is, is pretty remarkable. Well, yeah, I mean, well, we're very lucky, though. You know, Josh, at the end, end of the day, Sikinda started in, well, he started this business in, in 99, 1999. But he actually started earlier than that. So his parents' business dates back to the 70s. Um, so he grew up in whiskey. He's never known anything else. He's never known anything but drink. Uh, you can kind of tell that when you spend time with him. Um, and the, in some ways, that early 2000s period was a golden age for drinking, for people who, to, get into, to get into a subject like, like whiskey. You know, now there are loads of people discovering the category, which is fantastic. Um, but it almost feels painful that for them, like a bottle of this is going to be $2,000, $2, right? Yeah. And you go back to 2004 and it'd be like, whoa, 100 pound? And, oh. and you'd be going, it's a bit expensive. Yeah, yeah. A bit expensive, you know? 
So you, you've got to remember because he started then, and because he was a drinker, and I think that's a big difference. And I, I'm not, I'm not just blowing his trumpet. That goes across a lot of independent bowlers. You know, one of the reasons I think a lot of the independent bowlers, the best independent bowlers from that period, uh, have such good stocks is because they're drinkers. You know, you said signatory. Andrew Symington is is one of the best and biggest drinkers I've ever spent time with. He's a wonderful human being, but he loves he loves flavor. He loves whiskey. Right? You can mm-hmm. spend not talking about his whiskey. He's talking about every whiskey. He's yeah. about everything, um, and it means that the the buying the way you buy is different. It's not a brand. It's not a. It's you don't have a marketing department saying, "Well, this is what we're going to do." You just got somebody who really loves the spirit, and they go, "Well, I, you know what? I really like that. I'll buy ten of them. Well, I buy ten of them. Okay, if it takes me forever." Um, Andrew Simington told me this story once about about going back to kind of Port Ellen, and he said, um, "I don't know if you remember the uh, the otter. You know, he did that series with the the animals on them." Mm, wow. No, I don't. I don't remember that pictures, and he did like a young Port Ellen in that. And it's famous. It's not like one of the. It's an iconic bowl. Right? People are now trading it for thousands of pounds. And um, <laughs> and I asked him, I was like, "How do you get that stock?" Because I was sitting in a pub, and there was a guy sitting uh, at the other table going, "I've got all this Portella, and I can't sell it." Oh my god! Like, oh, I'll buy it. Uh, you know? And it's just a different. It was a different world. And for people who really loved the flavor of things who who believed that other people would love it too it was mm-hmm. a great and we're lucky that we kind of came out of that so i'm very lucky that i get to draw on that yeah. nowadays it's it's more difficult like i have to be a bit more i guess in some ways a bit more professional than maybe you had to be 20 years ago we have to think about the next 20 years i have to plan because i we've watched what happened in 2011 we know that it does sometimes the taps turn off. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So now you have to go, okay, well, we've got a plan for that. We've got, we've got to buy for that. We've got to buy whiskey so that we're never out of stock and we've got to fill yeah. new bills. So, you know, everything we've tried tonight is, is talking about aged stock, but we also buy white spirits. We, we buy spirit off the stills because the the best companies at doing this, the best independent bottlers, your, your signatories, your Douglas Lang, your GNMs, what they've been doing for, for now decades is, is laying down stock mm-hmm. to give them security. Because um, a distillery can always make more new make, right? They can always turn that bill on. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, it, we're very lucky, uh, but we're in a, that we have that history. Um, now it's up to me and, and um, the guys I work with to, to make the best out of that. And to take the, the stock we've got and to recognise its quality, um, but again, we're we're in a fortunate position because pretty much everyone I'm who works with me um, comes from almost almost entirely a drinks background in terms of they either worked in shops or bars. Mm-hmm. Everyone was a drinker. I don't yeah. I don't think I play anyone who's not a drinker. It's it's basically a prerequisite. You have to drink whiskey. And that way, everyone's kind of got the same ethos, right? We're doing it for the flavor of the drink, nothing else. Yep, yep. that's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. I love that. Um, we've, we've gone a bit over time here, but but I'm glad that we did because I think the, the conversation is important. But it also means that we've missed some questions. Do you, do you have a, a few extra minutes? All the time in the world. <laughs> Um, so something, where, where was it? Where was it? It came from Phil Minnett. There it is. I loved this question. What was the first whiskey that inspired you to get into developing your own whiskeys? What, what was that spark for you? That whiskey spark? Um, uh, two different things. So my whiskey spark is probably, is probably the Bamora Brocladi. Um, and that's in a very general, I want to be in the industry. In fact, it's probably Brooklady. I wanted to be in the industry because of Brooklady. I loved Brooklady. Um, I worked in a whiskey shop. It sounds daft. Like I, I loved whiskey. So I worked in a whiskey shop. Um, but I found I wanted to work in it forever because I went to Brooklady and I experienced that. Mm. Um, now, um, that's not the same as why I wanted to get into independent bowling because 
to be honest, up until 2011, 12, I didn't know what I wanted to do in whiskey. I just worked in retail and I did a bit of okay. brand ambassador work and tastings. And, you know, if I if it involved whiskey and I could get paid for it, I'd do it. But in, um, in 2012, I got engaged to my wife. Uh, we um, we got engaged at Bermore because it was one of the two distilleries that I loved most in the world. And um, and shortly after that, I did a, a training. I was working at the shop. I did a training with Compass Box. And I, you know, I, I used to live, uh, I'm not exaggerating, I used to live about a six-minute walk from their office. Okay. Um, so all the guys from my shop went over to Compass Box's office to have a, a night of blending. But, you know, really good fun with, with Greg Glass and, and uh, Chris Maven and um, Celine mm -hmm. uh, um And I, like, I knew the guys there quite well because we'd done lots of events with them and stuff. Um, we went along, and because I lived six minutes away, um, and they knew me very well. I said, look, could my fiance come with me? And they said, yeah, we'd love to have Laura there. We, you know, bring her along. So, so my wife is probably one of the very few people who's done a compass box trade training, uh, having never worked in the drinks trade ever in her life. And, um, we sat there and we, we made our blends, which was great fun. And at the end I was speaking with Greg and I said, um, this is amazing. Could you, could we make a blend for my wedding? And he was like, yeah. How much do you want? I, like, I don't know, about 10, 10 liters-ish. And wow. so I spent, I spent the next kind of, well, I can't be that long. I think I think I had about six weeks because I only had three months leeway between getting engaged and getting married. Um, and yeah, and Compass Box made me, made me um, at the time, it was the smallest ever blend they'd done, mm -hmm. uh, which was signed off by John, you know, John, uh, Greg made it with me. I used to go down to the office and we'd blend stuff together. And um, and afterwards, I remember moving to head office. So I moved to head office in 2013, started 2013, same time I got married. And my job at the time was pretty abstract. It involved lots of different things. Um, one of the things it involved was going up to Signatory uh, to help with the Kinder's cask picking. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we got back from that and I made this whiskey for my wedding and skin said what do you want to actually do you know there's you could do whatever you want what what job would you really want to do and i said i i just want to i want to do that i want to pick casks and make whiskey so for me it's not really one whiskey it's it was a mixture of the kind of compass box philosophy which i, I still love i think it's i think what john clay created at compass box is a really magical thing i think it's really special to be celebrated um, and then the cast selection of Signatory, which was just, um, you know, it's a whole new world when you look at their stocks and, and how it's managed. Um, and as a whiskey enthusiast, there's, there's, there is nothing better than having than someone opening a warehouse and saying, yeah, go on, what do you want? Um, and, and when I asked the kid of this, he was like, yeah, fine, you can, you can do that. Wow. You want that job? Go for it. Oh, that's fantastic. So, you know, it's... Um, Sounds like a nice wedding gift to you from Sikinder. Yeah, it wasn't bad as jobs go. I mean, it's had its ups and downs, Joshua, I'm not going to lie. There's, there are days and there are aspects of it that are not what you think they are. Um, okay. Yes. It's uh, more imagine. spreadsheet be, be based than it is um, wondering around warehouse. But um, but that would... Those, those are the things that kind of drove me on and and if I, on the whole kind of blending side, I'm nowhere, I still wouldn't say that I'm anywhere as, as talented as John or, uh, or, or, or Greg. Greg's a genius, utter genius. Um, but I aspire to have, uh, to, to, to get to that kind of level um, and that creativity. Yeah. At the moment, I'm still, I still feel I, I kind of live in a world where I drink stuff and I like it, which is a kind of classic independent bottler mentality um, I, yeah i i appreciate that you, you know you, you're making stuff that you would want to drink and you hope that people have similar palates but but i can also appreciate too that sometimes you need to blend for a wider array of of, 
of palettes too, right? There, there are different approaches. I, I can appreciate that. Um, so let me see, just a few more questions here. Another one from Travis Williams. And, and my guess is he may be talking more about the single cask selections here. Um, so you're looking for something in particular or something that just ticks all the boxes for you when it comes to your single cast selections? Neither. Um, oh. Absolutely neither. So um, I look at everything in terms of the, the make, the vintage, the cast type and whatnot, and I'll, I'll have that in a list. And then in my head, I've got what should it taste like mm -hmm. uh, versus does it taste nice? Okay. Those things are not necessarily the same. Mm -hmm. So to give an example, you might find a cask, you might go, okay, I've got Glen Losty, and I think Glen Losty's going to taste like X. So I've got, um, I've, uh, like yesterday, I've got some, some cask samples of Macduff, which we've held since since I bought them and got told off for buying them in 2015. <laughs> um, and, uh, and they were in all in first full sherry. And um, if I'm honest, I had I had very low expectations don't know the make that well um and two samples in i'm not looking at it going oh it needs to taste rich or it needs to taste like this or it needs to none of that really matters mm -hmm. um what i'm then looking at is okay one firstly do i like it does it fit into that category would i drink this uh do, and then and then it's more involved then it's okay does it suit the distillery character well what is the distillery character and then it's like mm. go and try a Devron, right? Go and read up on the distillery make. Some makes I know very well, some I don't. Um, then does it fit the distillery character now or does it fit the distillery character then? So mm. vintage. Um, and then I take all of that and I'll write down a list. Okay, so the first thing is, would I drink it? Yes. Now, does that mean it's the best whiskey and it ticks all the boxes? Not necessarily, because sometimes you drink something and it's not right for you now. Or... Yeah. It's not your style. Yep. And, you know, particularly on single casks, I think particularly on single casks, more than blends. On single casks, you have to bear in mind people like different things to you. So that's important. The, the, the only thing that I'm ever really looking for is, is it faulty? Is there something that's mm -hmm. not like about mm -hmm. this? Mm -hmm. um, but as long as there's no faults in it, okay, is it, is it something that I drink? Is it, is, are the flavors in balance with each other? Fine tick. And then it's about finding where it lives, right? Does it live in a, is it, is it a classic example of the distillate? Is it a classic example of the cask? Is it a classic, or is it none of those things, but it tastes great. Like yeah. I, I say Glen Lossy because I found some, uh, what they called bourbon hogshead Glen Lossies, um, which were mental. I was like uh, tutti frutti sweets, you Ooh. know? 1993? Sadly not. No. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. That was a good year for Glen Glen Lossy. Yeah. Um, but uh, like tutti frutti sweets, and I'm suddenly like, okay, well, what the hell am I going to do with it? You know, it's not single malt of Scotland because it's not classic in any way. So I've mm. got to find a new home for this. But I want to bottle it. So okay. I want to bottle it because it it ticks not all the boxes, but it ticks the box that why well, I feel these flavors are in balance. Um, okay. And that's why I say it's not either, because I'm never looking for the perfect cask. I learned that really early on. I remember doing the first series of Elements of Isla that I, I worked on. And one of my colleagues at the time, who's got the most tremendous palate, um, he didn't love any single cask we looked at. Wow. That's like, not, it's not great. It's not great. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. right. Like the casks in themselves were not great. They were not individually great. Hmm. We put them together, and I, my argument at the time was, well, look, they're really good, <laughs> hmm. really drinkable. Um, the thing I didn't know at the time, and this was pure luck, is that often when you bottle things, they get better, which helps. Um, mm -hmm. But if you are forever searching for the greatest whiskey, if you're ever searching for Porsche 45, then you will not bottle 99% of what comes across your desk. That's a really, that's a really good point. In yep. fact, 99.9. Um, what then Sikinda did afterwards is he used to give me samples from other independent bottlers. So I used to get, 
I used to get all the TWE samples from every IB that came into our office. And the reason you did that is because you need to understand the level. It's not about it's not about bottling the best thing every time. It's not that you need to get 91, 92, 93 points on whiskey fun every time. But what you need to make sure is that you're never dropping below 82, 83. Hmm. Right? And you need to know what that level is. You need to know that this is good quality, good drinking whiskey. Yeah. And this is your base. And, that, and as long as you're doing that, then you're going to do a good job. And, that, and it's more about doing a very good job all the time than doing an excellent job sometimes and no work the rest of the time. That is, that is not, that's not, you can't make that into something. You can't do that all the time. That's, I think that is a, is a perfect way to end the talk. I, I know Aaron Brasher had, had, a, had a question, Aaron, I'll, I'll answer that separately because we, we may go into a bit of a rabbit hole if we get, we get in there. He, he asked the question a bit earlier on. Um, but I think where you ended it is perfect. Ollie, thank you so much. It's, it's always a treat sitting down and talking with you. And I'm so excited. Like I, I planned this out perfectly. I'm going to get two Wednesdays, uh, well, Thursdays for you, but Wednesdays for me of hanging out and drinking with Ollie. And, and it's always just tons of fun fun and uh, I, I miss you dearly no i miss you it's been a it's been the, the worst part of my year is uh so i left all my trips in my calendar which was really stupid so like the whole of last week i was supposed to be in canada um it's really annoying i keep getting reminded you know this is where you should be tonight you should be drinking here tonight and um the most joyous thing for me over the last few years is actually coming to the us i, I get to go twice a year my best friend lives in um, in New Jersey, so I, I go visit him. And I, I, actually, two of my best friends, so one lives in Pennsylvania, and I go visit him too. So from a personal point of view, it's always great. But then from a work point of view, the, the best thing is that I get to see you uh, once a year, and then everyone else at Impex. So whether it's Dan in, in Florida or, you know, everyone I get to see is passionate about whiskey, so it's it's been a shit year because I didn't get to share that. I didn't get to go and do completely unruly things that I'm not supposed to do. Uh, <laughs> with people going, yeah, sure. We can go to another bar. And, Brilliant. When's my next <laughs> thing? About three hours. Great. Um, so it's, it's been a rubbish year for that. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty disappointed. But I'm very hopeful that 2021 with vaccines and whatnot, there'll be some kind of normality and I get to, come back to the US and, and have fun and say make inappropriate jokes in places and then run away. I, I'm going to mainline these vaccines. I'm just every vein imaginable is just going to go straight in. And Ali, I've, I've saved the remainder of my uh, Westland Inferno for you oh. so we can drink some Tabasco cask malt. You're such a kind man. I can't believe that is not considered to be a vaccine. If that is not a medical cure for COVID, I'm not sure what is. Did you just call me the C word while we're recording? <laughs> okay, okay. I just said I didn't know if I heard you properly or not. Okay. <laughs> it's after the watershed here, so I could do, but I'm not going to. Uh, uh, um, Ali, I will. I will let you go back to sleep. I, I just really quickly before you go while everybody else is on here. Um, so next week, next Wednesday, you're coming back and we will be discussing the single malts of Scotland brand. And so therefore, you know, I think Travis's last question about selecting casts, we'll, we'll, we're gonna really get into the nitty gritty of that. And then, uh, do I have that right? Yes, and then the week after that, we'll have Chris Udy back. Uh, so that'll be December 9. Uh, talking about the Matsui brand, so Japanese single malt, Japanese pure malt, and Japanese blends through Matsui, Kuriyoshi, and Totori brands, respectively. And then finally, and this may be too late for you, but Ali, if you feel like staying up, on, De on December 16 at 1.30 a.m. your time, um, 8.30 p.m. Eastern, 5.30 p.m. Pacific, I'm going to be interviewing Jason Johnston Yellen, 
to 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 get the you know the inside scoop into single cast nation. I have no idea what he may say, but I might get anyway. up early and and join you at three. Does that that sound doable? I could do that. I could maybe do if that. I see you pop up, we may we may just bring you in on the conversation. You know what? I'll share the Streamyard link, and if you feel like getting up, you're more than welcome to join. Well, I will, I will. I will definitely think about it if I don't fall asleep. <laughs> oh, oh, really quickly, and this is important because Jason says secrets will be shared. I don't know what that means. <laughs> don't know what that means. But uh, um, I'll I'll let you get back to sleep. Thank you so much for staying up. Hopefully, you had enough whiskey to help put you to sleep. I've I've done okay. Thank you very much, guys. And thank you everyone at home. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Cheers, everybody.